Um, welcome to the Okayama University Japan Times SDGs Virtual Global Circuit Academic Seminar organized by the Institute of Global Human Resource Development. I am Dr. Nobiki Kambara, professor of the Institute, and I'll be your host today. This webinar series covers topics related to Japanese culture or the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and sometimes both. We hope the broad range of topics will appeal to a wider audience and generate discussion and new ways of thinking. Let me address a couple of technical issues before we start. There will be a time for questions at, at the end of the presentations. You can ask your questions two ways. You can unmute your microphone or you can type your question into the chat function in Zoom. Please keep your microphone muted until the end when the question and answer time begins. Please be aware of that there is a function called Q&A. However, please don't use that one because we will only be checking the chat function. Also, please select all panelists and attendees in the drop box of your chat function. This way, everyone will be able to see the questions that are being asked. It will be it will also make it easier to understand the context, to, uh, context of answers that are given. Tonight's presentation is called Indigo and the Struggle for Sustainable, 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 sustainable Textile Dying. Our speaker is Teresa Stockwell. While studying uh, painting at Southern Illinois University, Teresa Stockwell became a studio assistant to John Linhardt, who was a prominent artist in the feminist fiber arts movement. At this time, at that time, uh, Teresa was introduced to a world of color. She was sent to Japan, where she became very interested in indigo and apprenticed with two indigo masters for more than five years. She opened her own dyeing studio in Krashki and focused on natural fermentation indigo along with other traditional dyeing techniques. She has traveled to the countries in South America, Africa, and Asia to learn the various ways that people from around the world have traditionally, traditionally used dyes, especially indigo. At this time, I will turn it over to Teresa Stockwell. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. So <laughs> I'll, I'll begin again. Um, so yes, um, I've been in Japan for quite a while and I originally came um, to study indigo specifically. And um, so, I have a, a lot of information about that that I would like to share with you. And um, I'll also talk a little bit about um, some of the hazards of the textile industry currently happening in the world. So can I start my slides? What I didn't want to do. Okay, here we go. Um, so this is Indigo and the Struggle for Sustainable Dying is um, the title of my talk. And um, okay, so I apologize. So let's begin again. And present. Okay, so um, Indigo and the Struggle for Sustainable Dying. Um, the reason I chose this title is because um, Indigo, it is a natural dye. Um, a lot of people know that it is a natural dye and natural dyes are considered safe um, for the uh, environment, but it, it always isn't the case. And um, any kind of dyeing or when you're working with textiles, it does cause um, some damage to the environment. So I just want to talk a little bit about that. So um, to begin, 
um, my indigo journey. Um, so as um, Kambara Sensei um, said, when I was a university student, I was studying painting and was a studio assistant to a, 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 a person who was working in textiles, an artist who was working in textiles and she is an indigo expert or was. And that is how I was first introduced to indigo. Um, I had no idea what it was before I met um, Joan Lintalt, my teacher. And she is very passionate about it, very passionate about dying. And she was working on a project. And so she sent all of her studio assistants to a different country to do some um, research for her. She had already traveled to many countries and uh, she just wanted more information. So I was sent to Japan. Um, this is when I was a university student and I was sent to study indigo. Um, after that, I went back to the United States and I graduated from university and I went to Thailand. And I went to, I was a, um, a student at Thammasat University. And while I was in Thailand, um, I saw the great influence of dyes and especially indigo in Thailand and Southeast Asia. So I, I was really starting to get hooked on, on indigo and really became interested in the process and the history of it. So I came back to Japan and, and actually became an apprentice um, to two different masters, indigo masters, one of them in Okayama and the other one in Saitama. So I worked with both of them for many years um, and learned a lot. Um, they were both very different in their techniques and their ideas about indigo. So it was a very interesting experience. Eventually I opened my own studio. I had lots of exhibitions um, and sold lots of work. I traveled to other countries and every time I traveled, I looked into the, the dying and almost every country has a, some history of indigo. So um, it's a very interesting thing to look into. I went back to Thailand as part of an indigo project that I will talk to you about a little bit later. In my own studio, I had my own apprentices and currently I'm not working with indigo so much, but I do um, sometimes help my old uh, mentors in their studios. And this is an old photograph of me um, doing, doing indigo. So, um, when I was working a lot with indigo, I did a lot of different uh, projects, lots of different kinds of work. Um, so I made clothing and um, also tapestries like this or this. Um, I made large art installations, for example, and also um, I worked on uh, set design. Uh, and so anyway, blue is a really wonderful color and it can be used in lots of different ways. So what I would like to do now is that when I was dying with indigo and especially making clothing, which involves buying fabric, finding a source to buy fabric, and then of course dyeing the fabric, a, a lot of um, worries, I guess, um, entered my mind about where everything comes from. And um, there are many, many statistics about how dangerous the textile industry is for the climate and the fashion industry in particular is doesn't have a very good reputation. So just to talk a little bit 
about the health and safety dangers in the fashion industry. Um, cotton dust is highly flammable and can damage the lungs. There have been many stories in the newspaper about people being trapped in, um, in cotton making facilities and um, not being able to get out and being caught in fires. Um, the dyeing and I'm sorry, dyeing and treating chemicals are bad for the environment and also for personal health. Um, you can breathe in the chemicals um, in their dust form. And also when they're dispersed in liquid, they can get into your skin. And the, many of the chemicals that are used in, in the textile industry are, are very dangerous for people and animals. And they mostly go out into the water or even if they're buried, they leach into the soil and eventually get into our water system. Um, the industrial equipment can cause physical injury if not correctly used or maintained. And um, there, has, there have been a lot of problems with um, old equipment being used in you know, third world countries where a lot of the textile industry is based and um, it can be very dangerous. There's very little oversight for these um, factories. And it's a, it's so um, old equipment is used and safety precautions are not taken. And there's a lot of health um, damage can, or there's a lot of problems for the people who work at these places. Their lax building codes are common. So the, the company doesn't look at the, how the buildings are built and they've been collapsing, especially in Bangladesh. There have been a couple of huge incidences and also child labor laws are not enforced. So these are some really big problems um, that the United Nations is addressing actually um, with the fashion industry. Um, there are a lot of environmental hazards um, from the textile industry. So the dyeing production and treatment of fabric um, causes just incredible pollution. So the biggest, the biggest problem is with the water pollution. And um, the textile industry causes 20% of all freshwater pollution. That's a lot. Um, it releases dangerous chemicals and heavy metals into the water. Um, air pollution. The textile industry accounts for 10% of all global carbon emissions. And it's the second largest industrial polluter. That's out of all industries if you can imagine that. The textile industry is the second largest, largest industrial polluter. And also with the solid waste pollution, um, which has gotten really, really bad due to the rise of um, fast fashion. Um, so this is a statistic for a few years ago. Um, 90 million items of clothing end up in landfills every year and um, fiber, the lint and scraps, also the chemical sludge. So when the chemicals, the water is strained and there's some um, chemical, it gets into the, um, it's usually a solid waste and it goes into these, and then also the packaging materials. So packaging materials for actual clothing, but also the plastic drums that hold dyes and things like this. Um, they wash up, uh, they end up in the ocean, they wash up on, on beaches and anyway, the, the textile industry is cause it has a lot of um, plastic pollution. So that's not all other bad news about the fashion industry from the United Nations. So see, these are some of the things that the UN is um, trying to uh, work on 
Um, so their statistics, what they say, the fashion industry is the second most polluting industry in the world. Um, it takes around 7,500 liters of water to make a single pair of jeans. So um, that's the same amount of water the average person drinks over seven years. It's amazing. Um, around half a million tons of microfiber, which is the equivalent of 3 million barrels of oil, um, is now being dumped into the ocean every year. And as we all know, microfiber are in the news a lot, not good. They get into the, the, the sea, into the sea creatures. We eat the sea creatures, like they get into our body. And we don't know what will happen down the line with the microfibers. And the fashion industry is responsible for more carbon emissions than all international flights and maritime shipping combined. So these are all things that really make you think um, about your choices <laughs> for um, clothing. Um, so uh, actually in this talk, I, I don't have any solutions for any of those things. Um, I just wanted to, to kind of raise awareness or make, make people think. Um, when I was dying and, and making clothing to sell, um, I always thought that it was very important to promote, um, it for selfish reasons, of course, but also um, to promote local um, artists who do make clothing because it's a, it's a much uh, envir more environmentally safe choice for, um, for clothing yourself. Although um, it's not a perfect choice, and um, but it is something to think about. So um, also, when I began dyeing, when I began working with fabrics and and using dyes, um, I started off using chemical dyes, and then being worried about the environment, I thought, oh, I should use um, natural dyes. Um, but as I will speak a little bit here, that's not always um, the best choice. Um, and you can ask me questions about this if you're interested in this topic about the difference between chemical and natural dyes because there's a lot of discussion, um, relevant discussion to be had, I think, about those two things. So first of all, just um, what are dyes exactly? So a, a dye is a color that chemically bonds to a fiber. It's, it's a pretty simple definition. Um, but what does that mean exactly and, and where do these colors come from? So first of all, I'm going to explain what a fiber is. So Fibers, there are many kinds of fibers, um, but the types of fibers used in textiles are vegetable, animal, semi-synthetic, and synthetic fibers. So um, vegetable fibers are cotton, hemp, jute, flax, sisal, banana, piña is pineapple fiber. Um, these banana and pineapple fi vegetable fibers are more common now. I think they used to be um, used a lot in some countries and now they're being used more in the fashion industry because they are a little bit more sustainable than cotton, which is the worst. <laughs> fiber in the world um, for clothing, but it's also the most common uh, fiber that we use for our clothing. But it uses the most water. It's a huge polluter. It causes a lot of problems. Um, so these are vegetable fibers. Some examples of animal fibers are silkworm, silkworm silk. We, we, specify silkworm silk because there's also, as you can see here, sea silk and spider silk. But silkworm silk, um, wool, which is different from wool is um, 
from you know a sheep and then we have cashmere and mohair and angora which are considered hairs so um, you can use other kind of hair in in fabric making as well dog hair cat hair human hair um, they're not commonly used but um, they can be and so sea silk um, is a very rare but very interesting fiber that comes from a shell. And spider silk is recently um, being used experimentally with some fabrics. And um, also NASA is looking into spider silk. It's, it's supposedly the strongest, the thinnest, strongest material there is. So um, those are some animal fibers, semi-synthetic fibers, which usually come from wood, are rayon and bamboo fiber. So these are bamboo fiber, um, is of course bamboo, as you know, it's a natural product, but in order to turn it into a fiber that we can weave to use for clothing, um, it has to go through a synthetic um, process where it's broken down and, and extruded through a, a very, to make fine fibers that then are woven. So that's wood, rayon is just made from trees, wood, wood and bamboo. Okay, synthetic fibers are made from petrochemicals. Um, they're nylon, polyester or dacron and Kevlon are some of the most common, but there are more. These are not all of them. So these are fibers and all of these fibers can be dyed. They can be colored with um, um, a process. So the types of dyes, um, these are the most common. Reactive dyes, um, mordant dyes, that dyes, and then these other ones. So fiber reactive dyes is what they're called. Almost all of our clothing that we wear has been dyed with fiber reactive dyes. And people who dye at home, like you can go to the home center and buy Dylon dyes. Those are fiber reactive dyes. The other most common brand is called Procyon, Procyon dyes. Um, mordant dyes um, are usually the natural dyes, dyes that um, come from plants. So any, almost any plant, um, will yield a color. So um, if you can imagine, you know, if you put spinach in a, a pot of boiling water, the water will turn green. And actually you can dye fabric with, with that. So almost any plant that you see out in the world um, will give you a color and it can be used as a dye, but it needs a mordant. Um, in order for it to stay, to fix itself onto the fabric. And I will talk more about mordants in a little bit. Um, that, that dyes. That dyes um, involve reduction in an alkaline solution and then oxidization. oxidization. So this sounds very difficult. Um, if you like chemistry, maybe you already know what this means, but um, a reduction, a reduction atmosphere is an atmosphere with no oxygen. Alkaline solutions are the opposite of acid solutions. So um, an, an alkaline solution is something like uh, um, soda ash or, or something like that. And um, oxidization is when the oxygen is touching something. Okay, so I will explain. I will explain more about this. But that is a vat dye, and the only natural vat dye that we have is indigo. Um, vat dyes can chemical dyes can also um, use vat dyes, and um, there aren't a lot. There are some but indigo is considered the original vat dye. And um, it's kind of amazing that ancient people figured this um, out. Other dyes, basic direct acid dispersed sulfur, 
uh, among many other types of dyes. But these are all dyes that I personally have used. So these are things that any person can do if they know how reactive dyes, mordant dyes, the indigo, basic direct acid and disperse. They all have different properties and they can dye different kinds of material. So I want to talk a little bit about pigments because um, one definition of dye is that it is water soluble. Um, this means that it dissolves in water and then chemically attaches itself to a fiber. So for the spinach example, if I put the spinach into the boiling water, the water turns green, that green color is actually dissolved in the water. So when I put, if I put fabric in there, the green, colored water will mix around with the fabric. And then in order for the color to attach itself to that fabric, we need to use a mordant from the word before, which I will explain again. So what's the reason I want to talk about pigments is because of this, the water soluble uh, example. So pigments, Pigments are coloring agents that are not soluble in water or any other liquid. They're not solu soluble in acid or, or um, oil or anything. Their pigments are often used in paints. They can be natural or synthetic. These are natural pigments from the earth. They're oxides from the earth. Many pigments are dug from the earth. And the most common from, come from iron. And one interesting thing to remember here is that indigo is not soluble in water. Okay, it's a considered a dye, but the actual blue aspect of indigo is not soluble in water. So it's partly a pigment. It's a very unique um, dye for many reasons. So anyway, these are beautiful colors from the earth and they can be used to color many things and they can also be used as dyes, meaning they can also color fabric. So here's an example of um, a pigment from the earth that this is my old studio that I dyed using um, uh, iron oxide. So in Fukia, which is a city in um, the north part of Okayama Prefecture, they dig iron oxide from the earth. And um, these are pictures, these are photographs from Fukia. So this is the, they're grinding up, they dig the, the iron ore from um, old copper mines. There used to have copper mines in Fukia, oops, in Fukia and, um, they stopped doing the copper mines after a, there was, a, they had many problems with the copper mines and now they dig iron oxide. And as I said, it can be used in paints. So here it is, here's some iron oxide that was mixed with um, 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 calcium to, to coat these walls. And it's also painted on the wood. So when I was um, experimenting with, um, it's called Bengara. When I was experimenting with Bengara, I dyed many, many things around my house with it. I dyed the walls and, and, and also fabric. So just an interesting um, side note, Ben, it's called Bengara, which is, a, it's used, it's a, the Japanese word, it's in katakana Bengara, to describe this, this red iron oxide color. And uh, the reason it's called Bengara, it, it's a word that they stole from Bengal, India, um, because Japan got the technique for using pigments from the earth to dye fabric from India, where they use pigments all the time to dye all their fabric. 
So here we are to um, synthetic versus um, natural dyes. Is one better than the other? And the short answer is um, no, not really. I mean, natural is probably a little bit better, but I'm going to explain why it's not as you may think. So um, chemical dyes are not good because they're made from petrochemicals and they use many, many chemicals. They're, the list is just a, a crazy long of, of all the chemicals and these chemicals do not dissipate. Um, they cause many problems, health problems to humans. Um, they can cause diseases and, and, and birth defects in animals and um, just all kinds of things. And usually big dye factories, um, big textile factories, they dye the fabric and they rinse it and all of the chemicals are just going out into the, into the rivers and then into the ocean. So um, the chemicals are not good naturally. So natural dyes use mordants. And so mordants, what are mordants? Mordants are used to adhere the color uh, to the fiber. So it's, it's needed to make the color not just disappear the first time. So if you dye your fabric and it's a beautiful color, if you don't use a mordant the second or the third time you wash that fabric, there won't be any more color in it. So mordants are heavy metals, um, iron, copper, tin, and aluminum. And right, we all know that heavy metals are not good for the, for the environment. And it's the same thing as these chemicals, they go out into the water system. And um, when they get into our body, they're not good. Also breathing the film, the, the, the breathing the, the, um, the, <laughs> the, when you're boiling the water and you put the, the iron or copper powder, usually there's two ways that it can get into your system. The powder, you can breathe in the powder or you can breathe in the fumes from the um, boiling water. So even home dyers, dyers will often say that they dye in their kitchen, but it's actually not very safe. Um, and you need to be very careful. Um, these iron and copper tin and aluminum mordants are just sold in places that sell natural dyes and um, people need to know that you need to be careful when you are using these. So um, the other thing about synthetic or natural dyes is that all dyes use a lot of water and um, that can be a problem for, for some places. Okay, so I want to talk about blue. Um, the history of blue is a little bit interesting. When we think of nature, there's actually a, a lot of blue everywhere. The sky is blue, water is blue. The vast majority of people in the world say that their favorite color is blue and uh, it's a very interesting color because it's considered a cool color, but it's also very calming and um, blue is very um, soothing color, I think for most people, very comfortable color. And um, it has a, a, a long history of, of use. In, in the world as well, because even though we see it everywhere in nature, it is actually not an easy color to produce. So humans um, cannot just simply make blue in an easy way. So the very, very first uh, blue that was used came from this, this rock. So this is a pigment. This is a pigment, it comes from the earth. It's called lapis lazuli or lazuli, lazuli. And um, it was first used in 7,570 BCE. So um, it was used a long time ago. Um, it wasn't, they don't see blue 
used in cave paintings. So they know that it took a while. It took a while for humans to figure out um, blue or how to use it. So the Egyptians used blue and um, lots of the ancient people. So anyway, 7,570 BCE is when lapis lazuli was start, first used. Um, another way for us to get blue is with indigo plants. And here are two kinds. This is the most common indigo plant that there is. It's called Indo, Indigofera tintoria. So you can see the word indigo right there. Okay, this is the most common indigo plant. The tintoria, the tint comes because it is a plant that makes a color. It tints the things. So um, this is a photograph that I took from a, a big, Indigofera tinctoria farm in Thailand. So it's the most common indigo plant in the world, but there are a few other plants that um, give a blue color. Um, the most common one in England is called woad. There's one in South America that's very similar to this one. Um, there's another kind in Thailand that's called um, nom, and uh, there is this one. Polygonum tinctoria, which is um, native to Japan. And it can also be found in China and Korea. So um, this is the indigo plant that the Japanese people have been using since they developed indigo dyeing. And this is actually a photograph from my garden. That's not recently, but a while ago. And here is actually, if you can look very closely, you might be able to see there's a little blue, <laughs> there's a little blue there. This actually looks like it has a design. This is woven fabric, look at this. So this is indigo dyed fabric found in Peru from 6,200 years ago. Um, both of these fabrics were found in Peru. Um, there's some argument about which one is older, probably this one, but the, not everyone agrees. So um, anyway, you can see the weaving, but look at this, look at how fine of a weave this is from 6,200 years ago. So making fabric um, was even longer ago than this, right? This making and making fiber and weaving such fine fabric um, was developed much longer ago than this. And then at some point, um, they started, humans began to color their fabric. And they say that this is, in, this is indigo and it may be one of the very first examples of dyed fabric. And what makes it kind of amazing is that to get the blue from the plant is not so easy as you might think. So here's another picture of the indigo plant and it's just drying out. It's dying at the top and you can see that the dry leaves have a kind of blue color. So if the ancient people looked at this plant and they saw that it dry, when it was dry, it looked a little bit blue, they may have wondered, how can we get this blue color? And as in the spinach example, if I throw this plant um, into a pot of boiling water, it actually will not make blue. It makes green, as you would think from this color. But if I put it into a blender, which of course the ancient people didn't have, and mix it up, it has a kind of light green color, but the minute it touches fabric, it will turn into a light blue. Um, that light blue color 
is not a strong color. Um, even if you use a mordant, it washes out very quickly. So the only way to make a permanent dye, to make a permanent color from indigo is for it to go through a very long process, um, as in the vat using a vat. And there is an, as if you can remember, the vat dye involves using an alkaline, an alkaline solution. So there is a very old story um, that comes from South America that says that the way they discovered how to use indigo to get blue dye is that um, one day a young mother and her baby were sitting um, in, in the woods or sitting by the side of a river and the mother set her baby down on a patch of bright green indigo leaves and the baby was wearing a diaper <laughs> and the baby peed into the diaper. And when the mother picked him up, he had a patch of blue where he had um, peed. So the urine is the alkaline solution, which caused to the chemical reaction on these leaves and it made a blue dye. And then it was, oh, maybe we can do this on purpose. So that's the, the story of the color blue in, in Peru. But you know, there's, there are actually, it's a kind of folk tale, but there are many similar stories to this about the accidental discovery of, of, of indigo, of how to get the blue from this plant. Um, this photograph here are various um, chunks of indigo. So again, if uh, we can remember a little bit of what I said earlier is that the indigo, the blue part of the indigo, we call that a pigment actually, the blue pigment of indigo is not soluble in water. So other plant dyes, the color dissolves in water, the pigment from indigo does not. And this is actually solid pigment from an indigo plant. And these are from around the world. These ones I think are from Japan. So many years ago, um, they would make these um, little balls called aidama. So in Japanese, ai means indigo and these balls, aidama, they're called. These, these are from like Turkey and India and anyway, all over the world, solid, forms of indigo, the indigo pigment in solid form. Um, so um, how do we get that, the, the pigment? There, there's actually, there are actually two main ways. So to get those hard um, chunks of the pure pigment from the indigo plant, um, it has to go through a process of mixing it with water and then letting the pigment, letting the non-soluble pigment settle to the bottom, draining off the water, and then taking those chunks, taking that sludge, drying it, and then making those, those hard pieces of indigo. And they do it that way in India now still and in Africa and South America and almost every place because you get a very pure, very um, strong color, right? So they don't do that in Japan. Um, this is how they do it in Japan. So these are the indigo leaves and they're first dried and then fermented. So after you harvest the leaves, re remember from the picture before, we get the, the, the blue color in the leaves there. So what you have to do is remove the leaves from the stem, the stem is red, and then you just make a big pile of the leaves. So I cannot even tell you how many millions of plants, plant leaves this is, 
but this is um, the, it, the, the people who do indigo, who make, this is called sukumo in Japanese. It's the fermented indigo leaves. It looks like dirt because it, basically that's what you're doing is you're making um, a, a, a soil actually from these leaves. So um, every, every place, there's only a few places that still do this. Most of them are in Tokushima. Um, this, this one is in Hyogo. Um, there's a, a, a young couple who are growing and making sukumo. So in Japan, um, because the indigo dye is a kind of artisan activity, um, and there are different steps, there are different specialists for each step of the process. So the skumo makers are their own group. So usually um, skumo makers, they don't really do a lot of dyeing. Um, they might to experiment with their own skumo production, but they're not really the dyeing experts. Or, um, so anyway, this is a, a big pile of leaves. And what they do is they cover it with these mats, which are old style tatami mats, and it starts to ferment. And it gets very, very hot in, inside of there. If you stick it there, if you stick your hand in there, you can't keep it in there for very long. It, um, what they do then is they, they stir it, they sprinkle it with water and they cover it and they just let the natural bacteria in the leaves start to ferment, to ferment this. And this is um, some of the traditional tools that were used. This is Hirai-san, the person in Hyogo. It's not a very good picture, but I thought I would show him it, with his skumo. And the, he's using the traditional tools that they have used for hundreds of years to make that specific shape. And um, uh, the people who weave these mats for the indigo are also another uh, branch of artisan. And the people who make these tools are another um, group. So um, anyway, they just look really cool. And I think that I want to take a break here because that's a lot of information. And I'm going to um, talk about some of the things that I've a project that I did with Indigo. So can, can we take a break? And if anybody has any questions so far about that, Kanbara Sensei, are you there? Uh, yes, oh, we okay. already got a question from uh, audience. Um, can you check the ch chat box? Teresa? Can you hear me, Teresa? It's time, so let's resume. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go back to my slides. Anybody, any more questions that you happen to think of? Burning questions that you happen to think of while you're on the break? Anybody? No? Okay. So, um, okay. So we'll start here. Um, let's see. So the, um, so traditionally, um, actually, in a lot of places in the world, um, um, people would have um, these kind of stories are most prominent in England and um, and in Japan. But so, um, if you recall the story of the little Peruvian baby um, peeing in his diapers and dyeing them. Um, they used to use um, urine actually as um, 
you know, as a catalyst for, for, for dyeing. And in England, there's a plant called woad um, that would yield a blue pigment. And so the stories are that uh, they would take, um, actually there's other folk stories around the world about the best, uh, the best pea to use is uh, that from a, a young baby, their, their first morning pea. So um, anyway, um, anyway, whoever it was would be peeing in a pot and <laughs> on the on the indigo, and they would keep it in the back of the stove to keep it warm, um, to cause of to a cause of fermentation, and then people would just die the the in their homes with the indigo. So it would be a thing that is forever going. It's kind of like a a, a sourdough starter or or something like that. Something that people would would have um, for dying. And in Japan, there are similar stories that lots of people would just, um, because there are some, some belief that the indigo will make the fabric stronger or um, when a fabric would get old or, you know, they would dye it in indigo to kind of, you know, refurbish it for a recycling technique. And um, the, um, the stationery shops uh, in Japan, they used to be called ayas, ayas, and the I for indigo. I is the Japanese word for indigo and ya is for shop. So an aya would sell, so this is a long, long time ago. So it wasn't like spiral notebooks, but um, they would sell um, things like inks, the calligraphy things, you know, and, um, one of them, one of the things that these ayas sold were um, the aidamas, the, the the hardened pigments of the indigo, and so people would take them home and and you know ferment them in some way, and so it was common, a common practice for people to die with indigo at at at, at some point, and you know it gradually died off and uh, people no longer did that on their own um and indigo became in japan it became this very artisan technique and um you know when i started doing it i was told a lot of things like i would never be able to understand indigo because i'm not japanese <laughs> like these kind of stories sometimes you hear because it's a really really traditional japanese thing and you have to be Japanese. And, and also, also, I would have to study 50 years before I could, you know, really master it because it, it was this technique and it was it was surrounded in this secrecy. And even though I was apprenticing, the first person that I apprenticed for, she would dole out the secrets, you know, <laughs> like as little treats or something, you know. And then, but I looked in a book, you know, and, and, and kind of figured out what she was doing. But, but you know, the, the, the mystery, the mystery around it, it, it's interesting, it's fun, and it was a way for um, these artisans to make money, I think, you know, like you're an expert, and, and, and it's also a lot of hard work. Um, so, you know, you want to, you, you are doing something special actually. And, um, it is like an elite art form or something, I guess you could think of it that way. But, um, at the same time, when I first came to Japan and started doing indigo, it was 30 years ago and these artisans were dying and no young people were, um, continuing and it was getting a real prop to be a problem and people were worrying and there was a bit of a panic that, you know, indigo is going to disappear in Japan. And um, so there were a few things that people were doing around to sort of generate interest um, for younger people to continue the tradition. And um, I started this 40 liter dye vat project. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to explain this and along the way, it will, I will also explain the process of the indigo vat, um, which it's like a chemistry project is, is what it is. Um, I hope it's interesting. If you have any questions, um, just please ask. So this is my 40 liter dye vat project. So usually a dye vat is this huge thing. The 
the average size is between 300 and 500 liters. And, um, you know, you don't have them in your home. But I was thinking that like back in the olden days when the ayahs existed, people didn't have, I don't believe, 300 liter dye vats. Um, although sometimes if you travel around Japan and you go to some old farm countries, you can sometimes see these big ceramic pots and nine times out of 10, those pots are were for, for dyeing, for indigo dyeing. Um, the other 10%, they were used for toilets, but um, that's another story. So anyway, the 40 liter dye vat project, I thought is something that um, it's, anyone, can, anyone can do it if they have the, the recipe the recipe for it. And 40 liters is, this is the size of a, you know, a garbage pail. So I thought at the time I had a studio assistant. So um, she's the one in these pictures. And we did this together, hoping to generate some interest. And the recipe is for a natural fermentation dye, indigo dye vat. So there are two kinds of vats. Um, it's not really a synthetic fermentation, but um, it, it uses chemicals. This is um, chemical free. It's ferment. It's a fermentation process. It still uses the alkaline, but it's not as much as the, the other process. So anyway, here it is. So this is the what you need to begin <laughs> your 40 liter dye vat, um, your 40 liter. So you need a bucket. And because this is a fermentation, Okay, it's like yogurt or it's, you know, you, we need to, to maintain a certain temperature and same as yogurt. So um, to keeping, keep it warm in the summertime, it's pretty easy. Sometimes you have to be careful that it doesn't get too warm, but in order to continue the process throughout the winter, um, this was the, the thing that we use. This is a, a, an electric blanket. Okay, the, the blue cloth tape and this little aluminum thing for insulation. So um, that's where we begin. Okay, so um, the materials that you're going to need are the skumo, um, which I usually bought my skumo from Hirai-san, the guy in um, Kyogo, because he was young. They were starting off and um, they didn't belong to the huge Tokushima clan down there. So um, this is skumo. Okay, this is a uh, rice bran or fusuma. This is um, calcium, okay? And it's a natural calcium, it came from shells. Um, and this is ash. And I got my ash from a, a guy who used a wood burning stove to make tofu and um, he would send me his ash. And so those are the materials that you need. And the first thing you need is an alkaline solution. So in the 100% not natural indigo dye vat, um, they don't use the ash, they use um, um, hydrochlor, uh, wait, it's called soda, so, well, soda ash, they use soda ash and hydrochloric acid, I guess, to make the alkaline solution. But so we're not using that harsher, we're not using that harsh chemical. So anyway, this is the ash. And so I'm going to make my alkaline solution with the ash and here it is. So this is a really pretty picture. I sifted it once, but it still had a lot of chunks in it. And those chunks, I don't want to go to waste. So anyway, I put the ash in water and let it sit and I checked the pH and then I begin straining it. And you, in order to maintain the vat and also to begin the vat, you need this calcium solution. And we don't wanna dump in the powder itself because the vat, it, that bucket is kind of small. And if you start filling it up with powder that doesn't dissolve, because remember the skumo, the indigo, it, that's not going to dissolve. It stays like mud. It stays at the bottom of the, of the, of the vat. So a good portion, like, you know, 10% is just got this sludge at the bottom. So anyway, you don't want to add more sludge to the bottom. So we make a solution and I, we made three strengths of it. So that's what um, 
Nachan is doing here. And this is my ash solution after straining it. And it's, I think it's really pretty. Um, okay, this is wrapping up the pot or, you know, the garbage pail, which is going to be an eye vat and or indigo vat. So first the insulation, and then I put this recycled blue tarp and it's all over. You can see the cord from the um, electric blanket sticking out there. Okay, all wrapped up nicely. And ready to go. Okay, so the, the skumo, preparing the skumo. Um, so because this is a small amount, Normally you wear boots and you stomp on it, but um, a small amount is really difficult to stomp on. You want to, what you're doing is it's in that, you know, like a, a, a hard dry form. And so we need to moisten it. And when you moisten it, it activates the bacteria. And you also want to create this kind of viscous kind of thing. So the more you stomp on it, the better. And so we just used, a, we put it into a bucket and we just started pounding it. And you know, you could pound it for like an hour. So um, that's what Natan is doing. <laughs> She's doing all the work in all these pictures. So just pounding, the, um, the, pounding that skumo. So you don't make it too liquid. You're turning it into a pulp, into a paste, and we're adding that ash solution. We're adding the alkali, okay? Because we want to, it's a, we're trying to make a good atmosphere for the bacteria because we want to cause a fermentation. Okay, this is a really nice paste um, situation we got going here with the skumo. And, you know, it smells like mud. It doesn't smell good smells a little bit like fertilizer, um, but look at how creamy and nice that is. So we're at this situation after, you know, a long time pounding, and then we're going to warm up that alkali even a little bit higher, up to about 40 degrees and dump it in here. And this goes through a process, there are three stages of it, and you start by filling it up a third of the way and you let it sort of activate and then you fill it up halfway and then you fill it up um, the, the full up to about this line here is where we did it. So this is the first edition of the, the alkali solution. So you can just see it's just this brown muddy color. Um, you wanna keep the temperature at 40 degrees. So that's what the blanket is for if it, you know, if it goes down. So, um, you know, check it every day. Um, check the temperature every morning when I woke up, I would check the temperature and then I would also check the pH. We mean a high alkali solution. So we usually want it to be up to like 12, 14 actually. And um, so when it's young, okay, as the fermentation goes, the alkali will, the pH will rise. Um, another thing that you have to do is stir it every day. So it was a morning thing. It's like a, it's a little pet, you know, wake up in the morning, stir the pot, check the temperature and check the pH. So at this time, when I had this little project going, I also had my big indigo vats going. So at that time, I actually had one 500 liter vat, two 300 liter vats, and then a smaller um, 200 liter vat. And then I had this. So it was, a, it was my, did my rounds every morning. Okay, so this is, as you can see, I think this is filled up to the top and it's still not doing that much. It's still like this brown color, but it's a little bit hard to tell in the, in the photographs you give it. So this is after stirring, right? You can see the, the foam coming and um, gradually the, the color will change, but um, sure here. Okay, this is where um, it gets real iridescent. It gets this like, it looks like it's a little foam 
or I'm sorry, this film of iridescence on top. It's not oil. I don't, it kind of looks like oil in this picture. It's not oil. It's not oily at all. This is, um, you know, those in Japanese, they have a name for this, but um, it's like the color of the beetles, you know, those iridescent beetles. And this foam, it's just beginning. It's still really young, but this is the beginning of my eye my aibana or eye as in indigo and then hana or flower. So what you're doing is when you stir it, you're making the, the indigo flower and the shape and size and the consistency of the bubbles in your indigo flower will help you to determine how healthy your indigo pot is. So you want to maintain a really healthy indigo pot in order to get a good color. So this is young, okay? The bubbles just started. I was probably really excited um, because we've got the iridescence here. This is oxidized indigo at the top of the pot here. And then my eye flower sort of started to bloom a little bit after I gave it a stir. So I'm, I give it a test and a um, little piece of fabric, dip it in the pot. It's not blue yet because the pot itself is a really high alkali atmosphere. When you pull the fabric out, the oxygen will hit the oxidiza oxi oxidization and, um, um, <laughs> and, um, it will start to turn blue. It will start to change the color. So the younger the pot, the longer that takes and the less strong that color is. So that's just dipping it in and pulling it out of the pot. Once we have this situation going, I test it every day with a strip of fabric. And to speed up the oxidization, the oxidization again, it's really slow when the pot is young. Um, so you can speed it up by running water over it. You can blow on it, make it go faster. But anyway, running water on it also helps get rid of that, that mud, you know, that, 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 that um, kind of the, that muddy color. So there it is. This is the same, same fabric, okay, turned blue. So this is one dip into my very young pot and we have a very pretty light blue. Okay, so we just want to maintain that. Again, this is, it's young. It's uh, it's like a little bit too brown on there. See my eye, my eye banner is quite small. So, um, and then, but anyway, checking the temperature and the the acidity or the, alk the alkaline, the pH balance every day. And these are my notes. So this is the first day that we died with it and then, um, maybe it wasn't doing so well. And so I didn't actually do a test and I started doing a test and look, here it is. This is one dip and the color is much darker. So from this, it usually takes about from the beginning to actually being able to die with it, depending on various factors and also the size, it takes about seven to 10 days for these, this, little, this little kind of pot will take about seven to 10 days. The give bigger pots you're looking at 10 to 14 days before you can die with it, if all goes well. So um, I can use my indigo that now. Um, one of the problems that we discovered with this, <laughs> which I should have known, um, was that most indigo vats, traditionally they're round because you have to stir them, you know? You have to stir them and so it's much easier to stir something round than rectangular. So it was really hard actually to make a beautiful eye, eye, um, eye bana. But anyway, we accomplished it as you can see there. Look at that, it's gorgeous. Okay, so this is our first um, dyeing project. And what we wanted to do with this um, was to see how many kilograms of fabric we would be able to dye with the one that, right? So we scaled down, you know, the, all the amounts of the skumo and everything that you're going to use. So I think we put three kilograms of skumo in here. Um, and 
So how much fabric can you dye with three kilograms of skumo? Um, the thinking is that the bigger the pot, the, the more pigment you'll actually get out of it. But my experiments showed that that's not necessarily true. So anyway, here's the white fabric and we wet it. It's wet before we put it into the vat because wet fabrics will wick color easier. Um, and we remove the ibana because those bubbles will stick to the fabric and prevent the, the, the dye, prevent the pigment from attaching to the fabric in that area. So you want to remove all the foam. And we save that and put it back because if you can see how blue that is, there's lots of pigment in there. So we don't want it to go to waste. Okay, dipping the fabric in, and um, you can see how it's kind of green there where it sort of pops up. And then you wring it out. And the wringing is a very important part of the indigo dyeing uh, process because um, as I stated before during the, just before the break is the, the molecules for the indigo are quite big. And actually the indigo does not penetrate the fiber because it's not water soluble. So it attaches itself to the outside of the fiber. So actually, you know, if, if you would take a cross section like of an indigo dyed piece of fabric and then, you know, flip it and look at it in a microscope, you would see that the core is not dyed. So, but in order to get as much dye into the fibers as much as you can, you really want to ring it in there. So quite physical. And then there's, that's not John, and that's the dye that we took out. So um, the, um, with, with the indigo, this is, it's not fully oxidized yet. And it, it will be much lighter than this. Part of what's making this dark at the moment is the, the brown, the tannin that, the tannin is still in the leaves. So when you rinse it, the tannin will, you know, go away and it will leave you with the pigment. So um, this is the tannin is still in there in the fabric and um, you dye it one time and it's a light color. And then what you want to do is to dye it over and over and over again to build up as many layers of those pigments as you can on the fabric to create a dark color. Okay, this is a more traditional um, indigo studio. This one is not mine. The, the indigo vats are buried or, you know, in a, in, a, um, in a house, you know, in a traditional Japanese house where you walk in and then you go up to the tatami. Um, that's basically what this is. This is like going up and the indigo vats are sitting down in that. And, um, this has four pots and many times in the center here, there's another lid that you lift up and they put like a hibachi in, in the very, very old days, it would be a hibachi, which is like a coal, you know, a heater, a, 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 a pot with coals in it to keep the, the temperature, to keep the vats, you know, between like 35 and 40 degrees. So, um, but these are the lids for the pots. These are something you can set. Um, this person was dyed only thread. Um, she was a weaver. And so her job was just dyeing thread. And actually she sold it. She didn't weave that much herself. So she would put these um, skeins of, of, of yarn onto these baskets and then lower the baskets down in there and then lift them up and then squeeze them and put them out. Okay, and look at, this is the Ibana, very nice and foamy. This is a good condition. If the bubbles are too big, it's, a, it's not in a very good condition. So this is just after stirring. Um, some blurry photos, but this is a, another place. So this is a, a place where the, actually the, the vat is not down into the earth that so you can stand and, and die with it. And these things are called shinchi. Um, you can see here, you suspend. It's got little pins, like little needles on the end of those bamboo sticks. And you 
poke it into the fabric and then you can suspend the fabric and dye big pieces of fabric in this way. Um, this is um, this is Natan again, and this is uh, my uh, my teacher in Saitama um, had these two one ton vats. Um, oops, let me go back. So um, these are humongous and deep. Like if I stood at the bottom, it would be over my head. And um, so I used to work for him and preparing the skumo and stuff, which was an, an amazingly hard job. But um, I took Natan there to, um, to visit him and she did some, some dyeing in his indigo vats. And oops, oh gosh. Okay, and um, this is an experiment that he had her do where you can see um, how the, the liquid will wick up, but this is just the tannin. The blue doesn't migrate that far up. And um, what this will show eventually is that, but this is, won't, be, won't have any color. And if you dip this one time, it will have a light color. And if you continue to dip it, the only parts of it more than once, you'll get gradations of blue. So she's working on the gradations of this high-tech technology here. And this is the that um, with the nothing in it, just some little sediment down there at the bottom. And this is Matsunaga Sensei in his studio. This is the big long tool that we use. So remember you have to stir the vat every day to keep the bacteria, you wanna give the bacteria enough oxygen so that it doesn't die. And so you have to stir it every day. So we use these tools for dipping. You have to dip way down to the bottom of that vat and the sludge, that sludge at the bottom. So this is a one ton vat. And so I think that there were 500 kilograms of skumo in there, if that's right. But if it, I can't remember, sorry. Um, anyway, you have to scoop up that, scoop it up, bring the skumo up to the top. And then, so you're kind of rotating it. So it's a little bit different than stirring, but you'd still create uh, the Adana. Um, this is another artist studio. And um, the way he kept his indigo vat warm was to, use a, a, like an immersion heater. This is a little bucket of water with his immersion heater down in there. And then he stuck that into the vat and this radiated heat out into the indigo. One of the things that happens with the, when you use the, um, for example, my blanket around the edge, the, the indigo will, will go sort of to, it's kind of migrates towards the heat. So it, you can sort of notice that some, oops, sometimes. And um, this is just his studio. Okay, so um, is everybody okay? No questions? So just the, my last few photos here are um, just a few that I took when I was in Thailand. Um, so um, I went, I went back to Thailand as part of a, a project. It was called Phi Gen Mai. It was um, organized by a woman at, um, at the at a university in Chiang Mai. And um, she was working with, um, whoops, she was working with silkworms. And um, the, it was a big project and what they, were, what they were trying to do was to get the people in the hill tribes to stop using chemical dyes and go back to traditional forms of dyeing. And indigo is uh, an indigenous plant in, in uh, Thailand. They have the, the indigo, in the, pol the uh, poly no, the indi indigo ferra tinctorum plant in, um, in Thailand, along with another one. Um, and they stopped using it, but it, you know, it grows wild there. So it's, it's everywhere. And, and they wanted 
um, the hill tribes to start using it again. And they were experimenting with the best ways to um, do their indigo because a lot of people had forgotten how to do it and stuff. So they have a traditional way and then the, the Japanese way, which is a little bit different. And so we went up there and we experimented and I was part of this really wonderful project. And um, I just have a few pictures here to show. So, you know, we're, we're doing basically the same thing. So these are the, the leaves and um, big piles of the indigo leaves and they're gonna, they're gonna ferment them. So at, at this particular place, um, they use this, to, this chemical uh, to, for the alkali solution. Um, they were telling me that it came from a cave and, and maybe it did, it was very, very harsh. But anyway, it's an alkali solution and, and probably a, a, some form of um, um, calcium or, or something like that. Anyway, and they would put it in the vat and they use this thing to just stir it like crazy. And um, this was another, a different place that used a little bit more traditional and old, uh, like a more traditional and more natural way to, to get the indigo going. And I just think this picture is great because they put the leaves into an alkali solution. They weighed it down with a rock. And as you can see, it's just like fermenting. The leaves are just fermenting on their own. It's making this blue foam and um, they'll take out this rock and uh, you know squeeze it out and then start using it. So um, this is the green before it's, uh, before it's oxidized, it's, it's green. And I think that's it. Oh, I have a couple of, um, Teresa, we lost your voice. Oh my gosh, what happened? So I, I just I just finished my talk and I'm not even on Zoom. So how long have I not been talking to you? Just a uh, few, few minutes, so uh, it doesn't. How far did I? How far did I get? You just, you finished the uh, talk, so. Okay, okay, oh, okay. So I guess when I shut off the, okay, okay, all right. So anyway, that's it. Um, sorry about all that. So any comments, questions? Uh, I'm going to unmute all participants, so then. Oh, hello, everybody. Oh, nice to see people I know. So Judy's asking, what is the disposal process for indigo? So um, the liquid, normally it, you just dump it on the ground. And um, what I did, uh, what my very first teacher did with the skumo, like the, the sludge at the bottom was we dug a hole in the garden and buried it. And actually her garden was like the most thriving <laughs> garden. I've ever. So it acted as a, a, a natural um, fertilizer. So if you do the natural, um, the, you know, the natural fermentation, there isn't really anything to worry about. Um, the, it, they don't really say like you should not dump it into water, into the water itself, um, although it won't harm anything too terribly, but people usually just dump it on the ground. Uh, 
Uh, if you have any question, um, please unmute yourself and you can speak up to the, uh, speak to the uh, Stockwell Sensei. So in, um, you know, in Kojima, oh, oh, thank you, Susan. Oh, thank you, Shana. So um, in Kojima, it, it's a big, um, it's a, it's a, you know, traditionally it's been a place where they've made fabrics and they still do that. And they're, it's gotten famous for jeans. And most of the places in Kojima still, they use synthetic indigo. Um, I didn't talk about that too much. It's a, it's a synthesized form of indigo. The process is still the same. You still use a vat. You're not fermenting anything, but you're still creating an alkali atmosphere and you still go through the oxidiza oxidization process. And so it's still a vat. Otherwise you can't get the color even with the synthetic indigo. But um, most of the places in Kojima use synthetic indigo, but there's a handful of, of, of places out there that are using um, natural indigo, the natural indigo with the natural fermentation process. So if it, you've got a lot of money to spend on jeans, <laughs> please support them. <laughs> They're expensive, but. Hmm. If, if anybody wants to start an indigo that I'll help you. Occasionally I get people come out. I still have some skumo left that I am sharing with people. It's almost gone. It seems to me uh, there is no question. So shall we wrap up? Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for hanging in and listening to, to everything. Um, Uh, can you recommend a flare to buy a, a tsutsugaki? Tsutsugaki? I forgot what that is. What is a tsutsugaki? I know the word, I've just forgotten. Um. Tsutsugaki. Are you talking about when the the, um, the funnel to draw with the indigo paste on the fabric before you dye? Is that is that what that is? Stencil. So okay, I, I okay, I'm recalling. So the tsutsugaki is actually it's a funnel, and you put the paste in, and you can draw on the fabric. So the stencil it, itself is something else, um, and it's called the kata. So, you know, any of those things, um, the best place to get them is Tanaka now in Kyoto. Um, it's a little bit expensive, but it's like almost the only place that you can get it unless you actually know the people who are making those things and they hardly are anymore. But the tutu, the tutsugaki, you know, that funnel, you can make it. You can make a funnel. And, and also sometimes people now just use like a ketchup the ketchup bottle. So if you're talking about, is, does that help? I'm not sure if that's what you're talking. So the, um, but if you want that traditional, like that paper and the stencil paper, which is really cool, right? It's a, it's like made, it's paper and then it's smoked with mulberry and um, you should get it from Tanaka now. The traditional tools, yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. So you must be dying, Alexis. So it's nice to hear. I'd like to see your work. Okay, anybody else? Hmm. 
It's a good place to be to collect stuff, actually, Okayama or Kyoto. Okay, are we finished? Okay. All right. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Stokoe Sensei. It was very interesting presentation. Oh, well, good. I'm glad. Thanks. <laughs> okay, thank you. Everyone, have a great evening. Good yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.